to provide an automated external defibrillator at every large swimming pool uh, facility under its jurisdiction and require that at least one DPR employee is trained to use an AED uh, during all hours of pool operation. Uh, we're joined by Councilmember Barron and Councilmember Moya. Uh, next is introduction 1042A, and it will permit the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, and the Department of Parks and Recreation to distribute any extra AEDs they have to additional youth sports leagues after they first fulfilled their obligation to provide uh, AEDs to youth baseball and softball leagues. And I want to congratulate Minority Leader Matteo on this. Next, we have two important pieces of legislation related to climate and the environment. Councilmember Costa Constantinides has put forward introduction 1619, which would make several technical and clarifying amendments to Local Law 97 of 2019. And next is Resolution 864A, sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, which would declare a climate emergency and it calls for accelerated actions to address the full range of ecological threats we're facing. San Francisco and other cities around the world have already issued climate emergency declarations, and New York City will be joining those other cities today. I want to congratulate Councilmember Kalos on this important resolution. Next is introduction 5B from Councilmember Inez Barron. It will require that restaurants in New York City display information messaging on healthy eating for individuals with diet-related conditions, including but not limited to diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. I know that the Councilmember has been working on this for a long time. I want to congratulate her and invite her up to speak on Thank this you. important bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so pleased today that Introduction 5B will be voted upon. You may recall in biology and physiology that you learned that your body needs the carbs to fuel it for the energy and the work that it's going to do. You may also remember that those carbs are then processed and become sugars. So what we're looking at is the fact that in New York City, there are many people who have chronic diseases such as prediabetes, which is leading towards diabetes and diabetes itself and other conditions such as heart disease. But we know that diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. And it's especially high amongst African Americans and Latinx. 29 million Americans have diabetes. And additionally, 86 million have prediabetes. And without intervention, 15 to 30 percent of those people will develop diabetes. So we know that the number that we're looking at is an astronomical number, and it's a number that we know if we have people aware of what their healthy eating choices are, that it can help reduce that incidence of people who have diabetes. And we're so excited that we're going to be introducing this legislation. It will be signage, it will be information, and it will be able to help people consider all the choices and their own particular lifestyle and diet needs as they make menu selections in the restaurants where they frequent. Thank you so much. I want to thank Indigo Washington. She gave the spark for this idea. It was her idea to be able to introduce this legislation and to inform people of diet choices and how it impacts their health. And I also want to thank the speaker. I want to thank the co prime co-sponsors and sponsors of this bill and look forward to its passing later today. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, my man. I want to call up Councilmember Kalos to speak on his uh, emergency climate resolution, which I had discussed before he came in. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm Councilmember Ben Kalos, and I believe in climate change. I believe that humans created climate, sorry, I believe that humans caused climate change and I believe that we have a climate emergency. Uh, I want to thank the speaker for also agreeing that we have a climate emergency. We need to activate on, across all sectors on a scale we haven't seen since World War II uh, in order to prevent this sixth mass extinction that we are currently experiencing. Today we vote on Resolution 864 to join over 657 other countries, cities, towns, and villages around the world that have declared a climate emergency. The climate change is real. We see the effects of climate change everywhere, every day, including today. Yet still, there are still climate change deniers, including President Trump, who called climate change a hoax and withdrew the country from the Paris Climate Accord. In that void, it's up to local governments to take up the mantle of action on climate change. Today, NYC will be the largest city in the world to declare a climate emergency, uh, and that's just because we're bigger and better than London. 
Uh, I want to thank Environmental Protection Chair Casa Constantinides for being my co-prime sponsor on this legislation, for scheduling a hearing within a month of its introduction, and for uh, passing this, and for having fought climate change all, all along, including the historic Climate Mobilization Act that he was able to pass along with our speaker, Corey Johnson, against great odds. I'd also like to thank uh, Nadia Johnson, Brad Reed, and Jeff Baker, and finally, there were so many advocates, we didn't have enough room in the hearing room. We filled uh, the city council committee room and folks had to wait outside for hours just to testify. Uh, from Extinction Rebellion, Christina C., who I saw at the Women's March and with whom we've been working with ever since, 350 Brooklyn, Indivisible Nation Brooklyn, One Queens Indivisible, Rise and Resist, Sunrise NYC, Sunrise NYU, Fridays for Future, where they brought out all these high school students and teenagers who are spending their Fridays here at City Hall, at the UN, and all over the world fighting climate change. These kids are inspirational. If I had done that much by the age of 16, who knows? Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to getting this done today. Thanks. Congratulations, Ben. And before she had walked in, I had mentioned uh, Councilmember Rose was able to uh, secure quite a bit uh, through the, the Bay rezoning, and I want to congratulate her on her hard negotiations. I know Cromwell has been something she's been fighting on for years and years and years since it was devastated in Sandy, and this has been a very long process, a multi-year process for her. So today's a culmination of that, and I really uh, respect her incredible negotiations, and I want to invite her up to speak on this important rezoning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without your support. Um, this took a lot of tenacity, and after long, four, four long years of community engagement, planning, planning, and more planning, the Bay Street rezoning is finally before us for a vote. This long-term plan for Stapleton and Tompkinsville will transform them into the neighborhoods that residents have been asking for, vibrant, diverse, walkable, and well-planned, with housing for a range of income levels and all the infrastructure that residents deserve. This has not been an easy process, but I pursued it willingly to address the pressing need for housing and to secure the public investments that we have long deserved and needed. This plan includes the construction of approximately 1,800 new apartments in the Bay Street rezoning area with more than 450 permanently affordable units through mandatory inclusionary housing. Using MIH options one and the deep affordability option. A commitment to build fully affordable housing on publicly owned property because my district is not a gated community, contrary to popular belief. Rental assistance vouchers to help more than 100 homeless families and individuals out of shelter into, and into affordable housing. Two new schools in Stapleton, one, for, one that's going to be located on our waterfront and one inland on Tompkins Avenue. 12 acres of new waterfront open space and a fully funded Tompkinsville Esplanade. $49 million in investment in pedestrian and roadway intersection improvements. And finally, the coup de grace, the thing that we've been waiting for for a very long time since Sandy, $92 million to rebuild our beloved Cromwell Recreation Center. This planning and infrastructure on a scale that we have never seen in the North Shore or Staten Island since the Verrazano Bridge. I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson and his wonderful land use staff for their support, for their guidance, and just for their patience through this entire process. And I will be urging my colleagues to vote yes on this application. Thank you, Speaker. Congratulations, Debbie. And uh, before she had walked in as well, I had mentioned uh, how long Councilmember Chin has spent on Haven Green, and I want to call her up to discuss this application. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for providing me with an opportunity to speak about an application to create over 100 units of senior housing in my council district. The path to this final vote has been a long one. For decades, this site in Little Italy has been promised as the future home 
for affordable housing. With this bill, our city is finally delivering on that promise. This project will create over 100 units of deeply affordable housing for elderly New Yorkers, including members of our city's LGBTQ community and the formerly homeless. Recognizing the community need for open space, more than 6,000 square feet of publicly accessible space was included in the original plan. Today, I'm proud of our effort to secure even more open space, space which include an agreement with an adjacent building owner to add thousands of more square feet to this project. As part of this agreement, 152 units of Section 8 apartment at this neighboring building will remain affordable. Taken together, these gains add even more benefits to an already strong application that address both the urgent need for affordable housing and open space for the neighborhood. This project has inflamed passions on both sides. However, I believe that no matter where you stand on this particular application, all of us want what's best for our neighborhood. Our city will need the passion and the commitment shown by both sides of this issue if we are to address the affordability crisis that is leaving too many New Yorkers behind. As someone who has been lucky enough to serve the city that I love for decades, I know we can meet this challenge just us we have met so many others. This collective effort is what we mean when we talk about housing justice for all. This is what we mean when we talk about building communities that welcome New Yorkers, regardless of their socioeconomic status, background, or identity. This is what we mean when we talk about doing the right thing for those most in need. That includes homeless seniors and the LGBTQ seniors of the Stonewall generation who fought for civil rights that we are celebrating this Pride Month. I thank Speaker Johnson for your support, uh, Chair Salamanca, our land use chair, and Chair Adams and the rest of my council colleagues for their consideration of this application. But I also want to thank the land use staff, especially uh, Roger Mann for helping us on this, Chelsea Kelly, and of course also HPD. Uh, Lacey Talbert and her team for helping us on this project. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank you. Uh, next is introduction 1331B, sponsored by Councilman Richie Torres, which would require the Department of Investigation to issue an annual report to the council on the total overtime hours recorded and the total overtime paid to NYCHA employees for the prior calendar year. The bill would also direct DOI to issue an annual report to the council on any small procurement contracts as defined by NYCHA's procurement rules awarded during the prior year, including an analysis regarding whether any housing development may have awarded small procurement contracts to avoid compliance with NYCHA procurement rules, and I would congratulate Richie uh, on this bill. Next is introduction 1549 by Councilmember Francisco Moya, which would rename 126th Street between Northern Boulevard and Roosevelt Avenue uh, in Queens, Seaver Way, and it would have amend the official city map accordingly. Tom Seaver, as you all know, is a Hall of Fame baseball pitcher who played 20 seasons, 12 with the Mets. He is one of only two pitchers in the history of baseball to have 300 wins, 3,000 strikeouts, a career ERA of under three, which is really good. He was instrumental in the Mets' victory over the Orioles in the 69 World Series where he pitched a one-run, 10-hitting, complete game to put the Mets up three to one. Tom Seaver embodies the spirit of the amazing 69 Mets, which is the team that means so much to our great city. We are proud of uh, him and we are so happy to do this today in his honor. And Councilman Moy has another bill, which we'll get to later. But I want to uh, congratulate and bring up the, the number one soccer fan in New York City, <laughs> Francisco Moya, to discuss the Mets. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I want to just uh, take this opportunity to say these are one of the fun things that we get to do here. Uh, you know, when you grow up in the shadows of Shea Stadium, uh, and live a few blocks away and get to uh, go see the, the team that you love and be able to immortalize uh, one of uh, our city's great heroes. Uh, I like to say that uh, Tom Seaver may not have uh, laid a brick uh, to build City Field, 
uh, but he laid the foundation uh, to what this franchise truly means to all of Queens uh, and to this city. And uh, I just couldn't be prouder of uh, being able to uh, finally have uh, his home uh, be called uh, Tom Seaver Way. 41 Tom Seaver Way uh, is going to be a great uh, day for all Met fans uh, who celebrated him and his amazing uh, career. And I think that uh, you know it's something that uh, we Met fans can be uh, proud of and look forward to. And I just want to thank the speaker again. I want to thank Rob Newman, uh, Jeff Baker, uh, and all those that worked uh, extremely hard in making sure that uh, this day could happen. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Thank you. Congratulations, Francisco. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, we have a package of bills relating to protections and services for transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary, and intersex individuals who are involved in the justice system. I would be happy to advance this package, of course, any time, but it is particularly meaningful uh, during this month, especially leading up to the great parade this Sunday. Transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary, intersex individuals face some of the greatest challenges when involved in the criminal justice system, and these bills address some of those systemic problems. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Laylene Polanco, who died earlier this month uh, on Rikers Island. Uh, she sh never should have been on Rikers Island to begin with, and the entire series of events which led to her being on Rikers uh, just shows the deep injustices and flaws uh, in our criminal justice system. Uh, I am so sorry for, uh, for her, for her family, um, and I know it's been really, really painful um, for, uh, of course, the folks that uh, were close to her. We honored just last week the House of Extravaganza, uh, which Laylene was a member of, um, and we're just um, so sad that we lost her, and I'm glad that there is an investigation going on. And I want to again thank Rosa Goldenson for her incredible reporting on this uh, for the city. Today, we're taking some serious steps to protect members of the trans community as well as gender nonconforming, non binary, and intersex individuals, as I mentioned. Introduction 1535A, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal will require the Board of Corrections to convene a task force composed of representatives from the Department of Corrections, the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, NYC Unity, Correctional Health Services, formerly incarcerated individuals, local service providers, local and national experts on transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary, and intersex policy, and people who were formerly incarcerated in the transgender housing unit at Rikers Island to the extent practicable. The task force would be responsible for publishing yearly reports containing recommendations on DOC policies regarding uh, TGNCNB and intersex individuals. And I want to invite Councilman Rosenthal to come up and speak on this really important bill, and I congratulate her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. I'm as you said, as we celebrate the tremendous advances made by the TGNCNBI community during Pride Month, we are confronted by the recent death of Laylene Polanco, a young transgender woman being held at Rikers. And keep in mind, even as, uh, as she was there, DOC says that they were trying out this new uh, procedure where any, uh, anyone at Rosie's uh, would be followed medically at least twice a day, any transgender person. And yet, she was found unconscious there. Laylene's death represents a terrible failure by the city of New York. This tragedy demands, among other things, far greater accountability and transparency on how the city treats transgender um, gender nonconforming, non-binary, and intersex people in its custody. All prisoners are highly vulnerable to abuse, and trans prisoners even more so. As we learned during a September 2018 City Council hearing, over one-third of trans and gender nonconforming people report sexual victimization in New York City jails. Shocking in its own right and shockingly disproportionately uh, higher than that against men or women. 
Today we're taking critical steps to better protect trans people in our custody and ensure that tragedies like the death of Laylene Polanco never happen again. My legislation requires the Board of Correction to convene a task force to review DOC policies to this particularly vulnerable population and make recommendations for immediate improvement. Critically, the task force will bring people with lived experiences to the table, as well as experts in transgender policy to ensure safe, humane, and respectful treatment of TGNC and BI persons in custody. Nationwide and here in New York City, transgender people are over-policed and over incarcerated. And when transgender, gender nonconforming, non binary, and intersex people land in prison, they are often misgendered, denied health care, placed in unsafe housing conditions, and suffer sexual abuse at disproportionate rates. The legislative package we're passing today establishes New York City as a leader in reforming the criminal justice system to protect and uphold the dignity of TGNC and BI incarcerated people. I am proud the council is moving forward with this legislation. I thank Speaker Johnson and Chair Powers for their leadership and all the advocates and service providers and the legal team here at the council who worked with me to make sure that we got this legislation right. Thank you. Next is um, a bill by Councilmember Diana Ayala, uh, which uh, two bills, introduction 1513A would ensure that individuals in the transgender housing unit not only have the same access to mental health treatment as do individuals housed el elsewhere, but also that all health professionals treating individuals who are transgender have specialized training in transgender and gender affirming care. And next is introduction 1514A, which will require that those housed in the transgender housing unit be afforded the same access to substance use treatment as those housed outside the unit. Passage of these bills will ensure that transgender individuals never have to choose between receiving appropriate substance use treatment or living in the THU. And finally, another bill by uh, Councilmember Moya, introduction 1530A, will require the Department of uh, Correction uh, to issue an incident level report to the Council and to the Board of Correction on housing requests made related to gender identity on a biannual basis and to issue an aggregate report to the public on an annual basis. This legislation will bring greater transparency into the application and appeals process for those who seek housing within the DOC that is responsive to their gender identity. And I'll invite Councilmember Moya up to speak on this important bill. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'll, I'll just be very brief. You know, uh, representing uh, a community uh, like Corona and Jackson Heights, uh, where we have a large trans community, it's extremely important uh, that uh, the protections are made for everyone. Uh, this would go to address these issues that uh, they are facing right now, uh, especially uh, when it comes to discrimination uh, and housing. So uh, I just want to thank the, the staff uh, for the hard work, uh, the speaker uh, for his support, uh, and we hope that uh, we can uh, make a difference uh, in the impact of so many people's lives right now. Thank you. Just personally, it's really heartening to see all of these bills that are uh, coming forward to protect transgender individuals, and they're not from LGBT council members. They're from mm -hmm. our allies and people who have a deep and long history of supporting the community, whether they were in the assembly or whether they were in previous positions inside or outside of government. It shows how much progress we've made, so I'm really grateful to all the members here for their commitment to LGBT, social justice, and civil rights. That is uh, our agenda today. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes, and I'm first happy to take any on-topic questions before we go off topic. Anything on topic? Yes, Sydney. I'm just curious, um, what are your thoughts going into the Republican leadership party? There's no news today on how you think this would be a turnout, and should we vote down today, despite the fact that virtually all of the Illinois electors are going to vote for Jen Crow in our state of the you know, rezonings, um, as every member here could tell you, um, are complicated and charged uh, with emotion, and sometimes that's not a bad thing. Um, and it's a long process, and 
Debbie has spent an enormous amount of time negotiating on this and doing a significant amount of outreach. I do think that some of the other people who were critical, um, they weren't critical, at least in my mind, of Debbie. They were critical of, I think, for the administration for not stepping forward with some initial investments. And Debbie had been fighting for these investments throughout the entire process on infrastructure. You saw what she had rattled off on the amount of schools, on the amount of transportation funding, on Cromwell, um, on all of the things that the community needs. So I'm really proud of her. I'm proud of her hard work. I'm proud of her negotiations. I know she's worked hard with uh, Chairs Moya and Salamanca on this throughout the process. So I think today is a really good day for her, and I'm really proud of her for uh, just her tenacity and for her work ethic and for the tough negotiations that she put forward. I don't want to speak for her. Do you want to say anything, Debbie? So, um, you know, when, we're, when I looked at this rezoning, I looked at this rezoning um, in terms of what the needs of the district were. And the needs in the district were housing, housing across the spectrum. And, um, and that seems to be where the bone of contention came, um, came into, uh, because people said that they needed and would like to see, instead of a shelter, they wanted to see permanent housing. And so I did everything I could to ensure that we would have permanent housing for a broad ne base need of, of uh, residents. And so we were able to get all of the things that we needed to um, support this corridor. We got the infrastructure that was necessary. We got concessions on, um, on the, the transit corridor. And so we made this. We are, I'm, and I'm really proud of this, we are delivering a viable, walkable neighborhood that the community not only wanted but needed. And so um, people have different reasons for why um, their, what their motivations are. I can't speak to those, but I do know that the reason it took so long for this to happen was because I insisted that I negotiate with the administration to get the things that we needed, to make sure that all the infrastructure was in place, that we had schools, um, thanks to Speaker Johnson, that our one hospital in the district that serves as our public hospital has been funded so that we can accommodate the health care needs. We worked really hard to ensure that all of the infrastructure was in place. And um, I'm frankly very proud of, of this and the investment. This is the largest infrastructure investment that's been made on the North Shore since the Verrazano Bridge. Congratulations. Sorry. It's okay. Oh. Thanks, Debbie. <laughs> Anything else on topic? Going once, going twice? Okay, off topic. Anna. I want to congratulate her on an incredible win. Uh, she joins a group of young elected officials, many of whom are women, many of whom are women of color. And as she said, she's a, a queer Latina born and raised in Queens. It is really, really inspiring to see. And I think her message has been a message of change. Um, and I said this, I think I said this the other day, um, that uh, I really believe two things win elections, having an inspiring, captivating message, which she had, as well as being deeply authentic. And she is a very authentic person, and she's someone who really captivated, um, I think, the hearts of Queens voters who uh, were looking for um, change. So I congratulate her. Um, the council just made record investments in criminal justice reform. Uh, those investments are also gonna be targeted at Queens. So uh, we're gonna work with her to implement uh, some of those. And uh, it's a very exciting day for her family. I was very moved to see her mom up there and her dad and to hear about her, the story her brother told. So I'm really, really pleased for her. You know, I, 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 I don't want today to, to be in any way about um, uh, 
raining on this really important day for her. Um, and I, and I, I really just congratulate her on a very impressive win. I mean, I don't support the legalization. I support the Nordic model, which would not uh, prosecute um, sex workers. And you're seeing in this budget, I think we might be the only country in the United States that has done this, a record investment of almost $9 million to help people who are involved in sex work. Um, and, uh, but I don't support the legalization because I believe you could create a commercial sex trade um, and that you could have people that are caught up in it who are trafficked or exploited. Uh, and so that is my concern. I understand some of the arguments that are made on the other side, um, but ultimately I, I want to make sure that vulnerable, marginalized, and um, people that have put it, been put in really difficult circumstances are not in any way uh, taken advantage of. So, you know, that is an area where we don't have agreement, but I do think that we agree that we want to ensure that people who are involved in the sex trade are treated with respect and dignity and get the services they need and are not arrested. Um, so I think there's some agreement there, but I don't go as far as um, our new DA, I think, is, has gone. Is there anything else off to Noah. Yes. 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 Um, has that fact and her death made you, if not reconsider, um, sort of any nuance to your position on this issue? Given that you know, advocates for decriminalization say she may not have had to be in jail uh, to have been part of this crime. Uh, my position is she shouldn't have been charged. The Nordic model, she wouldn't be charged. You don't charge people who are involved in sex work. You go after pimps and johns and traffickers and people who are creating a commercial sex trade. Um, but no, Laylene Polanco never should have been arrested for that. She never should have been on Rikers Island. She, it is a total tragedy from the very start of this to what happened with her untimely and tragic death. So no, I mean, my position's consistent with she never should have been on Rikers Island. The NYPD should not have been engaging in that type of uh, conduct. I mean, that's not how they should be focusing the resources. They should actually be ensuring that if individuals who are involved in the sex trade want services and support, that those are the type of services they're getting, not being entrapped potentially by the NYPD. Any other off-topic questions? Yeah, go ahead, no. It's okay, go ahead. Um, Yes. Yes. Yep. I'm wondering if you're going to either one or to both of those, and are you going to attend the Free Liberation March? If so, can you talk a little bit about why and why not? I'm going to both, and I've been working very closely with the organizers of the Queer Liberation March because it's a little, it's been logistically challenging because that march is starting at 9.30 in the morning from Stonewall and then marching up 6th Avenue to Central Park and then the parade is starting on 5th Avenue at noon, marching south and then across Christopher Street and uh, the parade is slated to have potentially over 4 million spectators and uh, over 100,000 marchers. The Queer Liberation March, we don't know how many people are gonna march. I hope it's a lot, because I'm so impressed with uh, organizers who have put this together. One of my uh, dearest and closest friends is Ann Northrup, who's been one of the main organizers of the Queer Liberation March. And I'm just so impressed with the work they've done. So I'm doing both. I'm doing the Queer Liberation March in the morning. I don't know if I'm gonna march the entire way to Central Park, because I have to do the parade as well, but I'm gonna march as, as long as I can, and then I'll come back down, meet, be with the council, and do the parade down Fifth Avenue, which will end in Chelsea, not far from where I live. Why do you think it's important to attend both? I mean, the, the Queer Liberation March has kind of opposed itself to these larger pride marches as well as celebrations of people being gay on, on Manhattan. Um, I just wondered, you know, what... I think part of the really 
moving and beautiful part of this month of June, celebrating 50 years since the Stonewall Uprising, has been hearkening back to the original roots of the LGBT civil rights movement. And that really is about honoring activists and advocates and people that have put their bodies and lives on the line. I say all the time, I've said many times, part of the reason why I'm alive today are because of the brave women and men who are part of ACT UP. Uh, that made it possible for me to have access to life-saving medication when I found out I was HIV positive in 2004 when I was 22. And I think the Queer Liberation March really takes away the corporate veneer that exists on the Pride Parade. And I think the Pride Parade serves a purpose as well. I think they both serve a purpose. But I like the more activist spirit of the Queer Liberation March and the fact that there are no corporations involved. It's really people making their own signs and marching uh, for liberation and for social justice for LGBTQ people. And so I think that is a really significant thing. The first march after Stonewall in 1970, it was called the Christopher Street March. And it was a march that went from Washington Square Park up to Central Park and ended on the Great Lawn. That was the first major march post Stonewall. And that march was like the Queer Liberation March. It was a march that there were no corporations involved. It was done entirely by activists at a very different time, uh, you know, just a year after 1969 and 1970. So um, I think you can celebrate the diversity of the entire LGBT community, and I think the Queer Liberation March does that. Rich? I want to highlight that I think there's a lot that I agree with her on. I agree with her on... <laughs> I'll get to that. Um, but I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we funded in the budget was 100 new beds for uh, men who have mental illness and we could divert from incarceration. I think one of the things she's talked about is moving more towards treatment of people who so they don't end up incarcerated and doing that work close with the community. So I think there's a lot of alignment on that and on working on ATIs and turn to incarceration, on diversion programs, on supervised release. So there's a lot of alignment and collaboration that exists there. I mentioned I, I don't support the legalization before, and I also don't support um, no new jails. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think Rikers Island is a moral stain on New York City. And I want to, again, give credit to my predecessor, Speaker Mark Viverito, for her leadership and hard work on putting the Independent Lipman Commission together, which recommended the closure of Rikers Island. But if you're going to close Rikers Island, you have to open up some type of facility somewhere. Um, and these borough-based facilities that Council Members Ayala, Levin, uh, Kozlowitz, and Chin have been working so hard on in the face of pretty significant opposition from both sides, from people that don't want a jail in their community to people who um, just don't want any new jails to begin with. They've, I think, been really responsible in how they've handled this. I want to shrink the Rikers population to as small as we can. I think with these new criminal justice reforms that went in place, that are going to go into place in January, the state legislature acted on, as well as the new funding that we put into the budget, that we can get the population somewhere probably between four and 5,000 people. I think the number yesterday was 7,800 people was the daily population on Rikers, I think as of yesterday. Um, but I, I want to handle this in a responsible and thoughtful manner. So I think those are two areas. But again, today's a really important day for her, for her family, for the campaign she ran, for the historic nature of her candidacy. And I look forward to working with her. Anyone else? Matt. Because I support the Nordic model, and the Nordic model is about ending the commercial sex trade while not prosecuting um, people that are involved. And you know, I've met with Sanctuary for Families, I've met with the anti-trafficking organizations, and I've met with some survivors, and they made a really compelling case to me. I'm not an expert on this, but I was really moved by the information that was given to me. And uh, I think that people on both sides, I think, on this, in this debate have really good intentions of wanting to ensure that we're treating people humanely and fairly and justly. But I'm afraid that um, you, could, you could create a commercial sex trade in New York City, uh, which doesn't exist 
anywhere in a regulated manner except one county in Nevada in the United States of America. Um, so those are my concerns about wanting to not create demand, which would then potentially bring more people here who would attempt to exploit and traffic people. This isn't this isn't about morality. It's about um, this is my I'm not I'm not judging anyone. Uh, this, it's really my concerns are based on trafficking. My concerns are based on exploitation, and there are there are some people who are involved in uh, sex work who are not trafficked and who are doing it um, on their own free will um, without being coerced in any way. But there are also plenty of people who are vulnerable and who are marginalized and have been targeted and have been exploited and have been trafficked. And I think part of the real difficulty of this conversation and debate is how do you sort those two things out? And that's the part that I found very difficult to sort through, is how do you sort those two things out? So for me, it's not a question of morality. It's just a question of ensuring that individuals in other countries that have um, really tragically and needlessly been brought into the commercial sex trade in a trafficked and exploited way, that we consider that really seriously. These are predominantly women, they're predominantly women of color, many of them are immigrants, some of them are undocumented, and I wanna make sure we handle this in a really thoughtful way. I don't know, did you wanna say anything, Helen? No, okay. I'm with you. Okay. The, the public advocates bill? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm not mistaken, there was a hearing last yep. month on it. Yep. Okay. Just uh, wanted to kind of get a sense of the status and the timeline, what, what you see, the, I guess, what's happening with it or what's going on. Honestly, I, I've just been so involved in the budget negotiations, I haven't gotten an update on it. Um, I'm sure I will uh, once this uh, week is over and I am back from vacation next week. Um, I'm going to go over all the sort of some of the pending legislation we have. Um, I think, uh, conceptually, I, I think that there's agreement. I, I want to ensure that New Yorkers have paid vacation, um, but I have some concerns about the size of the small businesses that um, could be impacted by it, um, especially there are concerns, I think, from the restaurant industry. There's, we've seen a decrease in restaurant jobs in New York City and hospitality jobs in the last few years. So I just want to make sure we handle it in a thoughtful and fair way. I haven't had the opportunity to sit with the public advocate. I haven't had the opportunity to be briefed by the staff on what the testimony was. But um, I think the goals are laudatory, but I want to make sure that we handle it in a thoughtful way and we think about how to ensure we could do something beneficial to New Yorkers without um, impacting these small businesses that already have been having a difficult time. Anyone else? Summer? I, I mean, I don't think the city's crackdown is over, but I think the city's crackdown um, should be over because, again, this is targeting uh, low-income, almost entirely immigrant delivery workers, and uh, they deserve some level of justice just to do their job every single day uh, to try to provide for themselves and for their families. Uh, and now that the state has done this, we are going to try to act expeditiously. Again, I just it was so involved in the budget, and I'm a little tired from the budget, that I haven't had a chance to, to be briefed on all the legislation. We have to do a deep dive of uh, what the effects are, the, what the effects from the end of the legislative session in Albany are, and what we can do, but I, I would want to move on this expeditiously. I still have concerns over scooters. I've talked about them many times on the streets of New York City. Um, I have concerns because I think that people could get potentially um, hurt or injured. Um, but number one are cars and trucks. They're the ultimate killers. And, and you know, we had that horrific, horrific death in my district this week at 23rd Street and 6th Avenue. Um, and um, then you saw the, the NYPD out there ticketing uh, cyclists yesterday, which is not the right response after a cyclist gets killed. The right response is to make sure that these trucks and the truck that killed this individual um, was uh, an illegal truck. It was, in it was a tractor trailer that's banned from New York City, the length of it, but they're out there ticketing cyclists. They should be out there getting 
these tractor trailer trucks off the road that are not supposed to be in New York City because they're unsafe. So these will go through the legislative process. I do support us legalizing the e-bikes so there's justice for these workers. I have concerns on the e-scooters, um, but I'm, I want to work with my colleagues. I think there are some council members who actually like e-scooters. Councilmember Espinal has been a big champion of them, and I want to have the opportunity to speak with him uh, and see what we can actually do under the authority that Albany gave us on e-bikes and e-scooters now. I think the mayor has strong feelings on this. I mean, the mayor, I don't think is supportive. And is that because of the of leadership that there are times when the biker shows will be riding on the The mayor has to answer that for himself. I, 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 I told you how I felt. Uh, anyone else? Are you going to watch the debate? Yes, I'm going <laughs> to watch the debate. I'm watching the debate. Is the mayor debating tonight or tomorrow? Tonight. 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 Uh, I'm watching the debate. <laughs> Jen said thank you, bye. <laughs>